I'd like to introduce you to our speakers. We are extremely pleased to have CompuWare specialists Atul Bogan and Alan Johns with us today to cover the top five mainframe DevOps drivers, challenges, and solutions. So with that, I would like to welcome and hand things over to Alan. Alan? Thank you very much, Kim. And welcome and good afternoon to everybody for this session. Now, the concept behind what we're going to be uh, discussing today is an outgrowth of a session that we did at a recent ZTEC uh, conference uh, held in London. Now, one of those sessions we ran there was what we call a poster session, where we gave the attendees the opportunity to discuss the issues they were having on the DevOps platform, that may be mainframe and distributed as well. Now, the idea was that we wanted to couch the questions and the discussion around DevOps in such a way as to make it interesting and, and make people think a little bit more about what we were discussing. So what we did was we uh, couched the questions in the context of a quite a famous uh, Shakespearean play known as The Merchant of Venice. Now, in The Merchant of Venice, it talks about uh, our hero, Antonio, who's a merchant, and he has um, borrowed some money from a... Uh, a, a loan shark called Shylock and Shylock's putting some rather unpleasant um, <laughs> unpleasant things he's going to do to Antonio if he doesn't get the money back and halfway through the play Antonio finds that uh, his entire fleet has been sunk uh, in a storm and he can no longer pay Shylock back so he's in all his plans all his operations are now looking to be defunct. Now, in terms of uh, our subject, the mainframe DevOps uh, approach that people want to take, imagine this. You have decided within your company to go along the DevOps route. So you set everything up. You place all your DevOps uh, objectives into your DevOps ship. And then you set it out on the IT sea of hopes and opportunities. However, halfway along, your ship starts to slow down. Things don't seem to work in the way you wish them to. And it's almost as if somebody's thrown an anchor, an anchor out the back of the ship and everything slows down and it really starts to go, why did we do this in the first place? Why did we go along this? Why are we slowing down and what can we do to solve this issue? So. In talking to the delegates at ZTEC, we tried to couch these questions in so that we said to them, okay, for your DevOps project, what is it that's driving you? What is the wind in your sails on your ship of DevOps hopes and opportunities? What's driving you? And then what's, what's causing the slowdown? What are the anchors, if you wish? that are slowing your projects down. And the third one, well, what would it take to pull those anchors up? What are the solutions to, this, to what's slowing you down? And we got an, a lot of response from this, from the delegates. And what we'd like to do is present to you the top five or six for each of those, what we call apps, each of those elements, and present them to you and discuss them. And hopefully, during that discussion, this will give you some uh, uh, views, some best practices, ways forward that you can use within your own DevOps projects. So with that, we'll deal with the first one. What is the wind in your sails? What was driving your particular uh, requirements for DevOps? Atul, what do you think about this? OK, so um, thanks, Alan. So let's take these um, one at a time. So we've got a top five here in terms of what is the wind in your sail. Um, if we first of all focus on the business demands. Now, we know that in all businesses, there is a tremendous demand to grow sales and remain competitive, regardless of what industry you're working in. Now, these demands are becoming more relevant because more and more businesses have IT at the center of the operations. 
Now, if whether you look at banking, let's say insurance, retail, um, government, for example, you name it, and IT is fundamental to what they do. Okay. Now, because this is now directly linked to IT, IT is given that prominence, uh, the resource and the budget it now deserves as well. So that's a change we're seeing currently. Now, th this actually includes the mainframe as well. So this, this is truly the wind in the sails to move forward our DevOps adoption. So um, what we're looking at here is when you talk about the wind in your sail, there is a great business demand. So we do have to move with the times. So that is something that is moving us forward. So that's a great point, I think. If I just move on to the next point here. So demand for speed to market. So that was another great point that was um, raised to us. So Alan, do you want to talk about this one? Thanks, Adam. Um, yes, it was. this was linked to the first point. Uh, but it, as, a, as a separate thing, it's definitely worth calling out. Um, all the businesses that we've talked to, ha and all business generally, really, have that drive to innovate, to be innovative, in, 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 to innovate. I'll stick with that one. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> the, there are hundreds of ideas that are, are put forward by our customers, employees, and consultants about what they can do to improve the business. Business. However, they they don't make it live. They don't seem to make it live for a very long time. They don't actually get those ideas out into a solid, concrete project. And by that time, if they do get it out, it's, it's been months or years, and, and by that time, the idea may no longer be relevant. Uh, so speed to market is essential if we are to compete in the here and now. Uh, we need to focus on that velocity so we can enable our businesses to and our business applications to be able to morph, to change into what's needed and keep the customers interested, to keep the customers coming back to us. If not, then we're going to give a free lunch to our competitors. You're right, Alan. I think um, that word velocity, I like that one, because it's showing us that we're moving fast and in the right direction. Yeah, and so, I think it's something everybody recognizes. Definitely. Okay, good point. So the next one we want to deal with, and the, 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 the next point it came up with, was the, the concept of collaboration. So. That's all if you want to take that one. Yeah, yeah, thanks, Alan. So on this one, really, I've seen so many examples where um, there's been great success in situations where cross-functional teams have come together and they're delivering new capabilities to the business. Yeah. It's as simple as that. And this cross-functional team concept, what that really does, it eliminates, eliminates the wastage uh, in terms of time and, and simply resources waiting for things to get done. Okay, now this is actually a baseline principle of lean, if any of you have come across that or adopted that in the past as well. So I've been involved in projects where, for example, uh, a DBA is on holiday. So we now have to wait for one week for her to return before we even get a test environment up and running and available for us to use. So I, I just think that's just crazy. Yeah. yeah. So I think bringing together the right skills, building the teams and just letting them do their magic, it really does work, yeah? And you'll see the transformation in, in terms of culture, which is quite fundamental. Um, and that involves knowledge sharing, open communication, um, re reduction in conflict. And the other aspect of it is the sparking of innovation, and, and that really does speed up delivery. So that creativity really does shine through, I think. Now, collaboration is a major step towards moving to agile ways of working. So this is one which, for the sites that, that have adopted a new way of working, collaboration is a key part of that transformation and they've really embraced it. So it is definitely the, the wind in the sail for them as well. Yeah. Okay, so move on to the next point, passion. This is interesting. Alan, do you want to talk about this? I think, yes, it's, it's, it's for this, this today's discussion, it, passion as a term, it has two real elements. Steady on, steady on. We've got, <laughs> Many people are what you might call cage tigers. Um, they have so much to offer. They have so many ideas bouncing around in their heads, but they're limited by their role or their job title. Uh, and empowering these people to experiment with new ideas, with tools, processes, can lead, lead to such great rewards within both teams and externally to the teams. I mean, it goes back to the collaboration idea. If you can get people to be passionate 
about what they do and about being able to empower the people with all the ideas to get things done. And that's going to spread across all teams. Hmm. It's contagious. Yeah. The whole idea of, of, of being passionate about what you do is contagious. It's amazing how one person's passion can energize other people. And it's got to be encouraged because it means everybody's going to enjoy their work more and productivity goes through the roof. It's like any manager worth mm. his salt will tell you. Yeah. If you can encourage people to do the things they want to do, mm. they will do it. They will work their butts off to get this stuff done. And it's things we've seen in, in the teams that we're dealing with, the companies we're dealing with. Yeah. The people who are getting there yeah. are the people who embrace the passion and work with it. That's true. I agree with that. You know what? I think the term you use there, cage tigers. Yeah. I like that. I've seen a lot of those cage tigers in the accounts I'm involved in. And they really do make a big difference. And, and again, put the wind in the sail. To yeah. Encourage the people well. to do things. Excellent point. Great point. So what's the next term? Well, this really came forward with a lot of people. Is that you need to get buy-in from the leadership, from the people at the top. So what do you think about that? Okay, I think, so Alan, it might sound obvious, but this actually is so crucial. So the transformation in the way we work, um, in our, the way our organizations work, is pretty significant. So when it comes to moving from uh, ways of working like waterfall, for example, to agile, it's not easy and it can't happen overnight. It mm. just cannot, yeah? Now, it's very easy for some parts of the business to get left behind while others are racing ahead. So I think leadership needs to drive the change but also, in, in addition to that, really give permission for the teams to experiment with new processes and tools. Mistakes are going to happen, okay? Mm, but, always. you know, as Jess Glynn would say, don't be too hard on yourself, yeah? Um, leadership needs to allow for this. And rather than punish the teams, we've got to make sure they're allowed them to grow. Um, we've seen great examples of this in organizations, um, uh, even locally in our accounts, that nurture those passionate explorers. Ultimately, they will give the business the edge over the competition. Mm, yeah. Definitely. So I think I think that is a great point in terms of um, driving your your change forward within the organisation itself as well. Now, just on that one, I wanted to add one more slide here. So um, I think um, at CompuWare we are motivated to educate and spread awareness about the need for mainframe transformations, and none more so than our CEO Christopher O'Malley, which I think many of you will already have heard of him and following him on Twitter and LinkedIn as well. Now, in one of his most recent posts, he put out an observation, which I think is quite um, worthy of being called out today, that the most successful mainframe DevOps transformations are spearheaded typically by people who have implemented DevOps before, okay? Now, these people are not necessarily people from mainframe backgrounds or with in-depth knowledge of mainframes themselves as well. Yeah. They don't see limitations that often the, tr the mainframers um, who for many years have perceived and, and that they still perceive these limitations on the platform as well. So personally, what I would advise is for everyone to, to read and share, I think some of these posts within your organizations and really start bringing forward some of these, these changes and recommendations that are put out there in terms of how leadership should be behaving and the type of thinking they would have as well. Definitely. It makes it very interesting as well. as a very articulate gentleman. Yeah, I, I agree. Definitely. Now, I know that at this um, ZTech event, we had quite a lot of great discussions, oh, in-depth yes. discussions. Now, obviously, we've picked the top five from the category of what is the wind in your sail. But what I'm showing on the screen now are just a few of the other key points that we identified as well. So there were a lot of discussions taking place as well. Lots of positives, really. Now, there's one point I'd like to pick out, and it's at the bottom of the left-hand side column. So somebody mentioned to us the need for change, survival as such, okay? Now, if you think about it, in the past, um, large businesses were categorized as too big to fail. Mm -hmm. That really is how they saw themselves. And I think we've all seen examples where this is no longer the case. So I think that mantra has now changed to some of the businesses are just too slow to survive. Yeah. We have to bear that in mind, okay? Now, I just personally think if this threat doesn't put the wind in your sail, I don't know what will. It really is something that businesses have to recognize 
for future survival. Absolutely. It's the whole concept of treating your business almost like a startup. You've yeah. got to be agile. Exactly. Exactly. Okay. Well, moving on. So, um, in the second category, really, we're talking about the anchors. What is holding us back from moving forward? Now, we've listed here the top five we've identified. Obviously, there were many more, which we'll show you a little bit later on as well. So, Alan, do you want to look at the first one here, the lack of understanding of what is possible in terms of transformation? Yes, I, I've heard this so many times. People hear some of the buzzwords of, of, of DevOps and, and Agile, uh, and they, they, it sounds all really sexy, but without understanding, what fully understanding what is possible, what they really mean by DevOps and Agile in the context of your own business, mm -hmm. people are left in this, this sort of waistline where they want to make improvements, mm -hmm. but they have no real direction or even any real idea of the destination of what should be their goal. What do they want to do? What do they want to achieve? Now, there's a, a lot of material on the web, uh, some of it technical, some of it well written to introduce the concepts. We have a lot of it in CompuWeb. Mm -hmm. yep. And, <coughs> excuse me, I would like to suggest two really good resources. The first one, which I had some interesting discussions with, with some people at ZTEC, mm -hmm. uh, is a, a novel by a gentleman called Gene Kim called The Phoenix Project. Now, this is a, a, an extremely well-written novel, which it talks about how a company gets involved in implementing DevOps and Agile within their environment. It gives you an appreciation of why Agile transformation is so important. Uh, it's, the company was struggling to cope. It was losing market share. Mm. The people were getting sacked. And this, the, the hero was given the, the, the task of improving what they did and getting their projects up to speed and on time and delivered. And he went through this whole DevOps Agile transformation. Mm -hmm. And I think you will see as you read through it that you will get the continuous, this is exactly my experience type thing. I, 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 I had remember, the same experience. I that. Yes, that was me. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's a really good read to get people involved in the basic concepts behind DevOps. True. Alan, so without giving too much away, there's three three points I think I'd like to highlight from that yeah. really, yeah? So so in reading the, the novel itself, three ways of DevOps came out. That's quite highlighted quite clearly in there. So one was flow, so making sure that our uh, progress in terms of our life cycle is moving forward all the time, yeah. yeah? Second one was feedback. We need to be seeking feedback as quickly as possible as often as possible. Yes. And this is what's going to influence what's this the term is shift left yep. in the industry currently. And the third one is this culture of continual experimentation and learning. So I won't go into it much more than that, but these are some of the key points that yeah. come out novel. Definitely worth reading. One thing yeah. I would I would add to that. Yeah. Whenever you're doing this, don't be afraid of failure. Failure in a lot of cases is good because you learn from it. Exactly. Don't be afraid of it. Good point. Now, the second thing, that um, the second resource I'd, I'd like to mention is CompuWare's own white paper on DevOps, the 10 steps to true mainframe agility. Now, this is based on our experience of our own transformation, which started, what, four years ago or thereabouts? Sure, yeah. Where we decided to go entirely mainframe in terms of development, get rid of all the servers and go agile and DevOps. And to that, we added the experiences of, of some of our clients as well. And what we're trying to do with this is paint a picture of some of the key transformational points that you should consider in your journey into DevOps. Uh, it's, it's a, if you like it, it works as a framework mm -hmm. and tells you the types of questions you should ask yourselves. Yeah when you're considering well what do we need to do to get to where we want to go and it starts i mean starting with where do we want to go mm. so and moving forward from there so know what success looks like for you exactly yeah. yeah so download it have a read of it and by all means if you want to reach out to us and we're quite happy to discuss this at any mm. time but i think you'll find you can almost use it as a, a sort of a a shorthand bible to go towards what devops is Combine that with the Phoenix Project, with Gene Kim's 
DevOps handbook, and there's a lot of stuff out there. Yeah. Get the whole concept straight in your mind, and then you'll find yourself working a lot better. Great. Okay. Continuing on, as, as looking at our anchors, our stoppers, the next one that came out was, well, it's been working for many years. Why change? It's the, if it's not broke, don't fix it mentality. What do you think about that one, Matthew? Okay, I mean, I've heard this so many times, I can mm. tell you that, yeah. But I suppose it's it's human nature to resist change. That's what yeah. we do, yeah? But I think as leaders, um, we've got to make sure that they must recognize that change. And that's what actually keeps us ahead of the game, ahead of our competition, yeah? yeah. Now, in IT, that, that means that developers and production support teams exist because there is constant change, yeah? Our applications are always changing, and they're driven by business demands and governance in many cases as well. So uh, truly, I, I do believe we have to address that resistance head on. You know, we can't hide from that. Mm. And one of the ways I've seen it done really well is by socializing the benefits of changing, um, the ways we work, and also communicate why the change is necessary. Yeah. I think people have to see the justification for it and the benefits as well. So there's so many organizations who are proudly announcing their, their change um, and, and you may have to experience this like yourselves on things like um, LinkedIn and Twitter or other social media platforms as well. Um, personally, I've been involved in some organizations where they've been running pilots. And out of that, they're sharing their outcomes to the wider community. Uh, also, if things fail, and obviously we have to learn lessons from that and we try again, that's nothing to be ashamed of. It's, it's something that happens in real life. So the culture of 100% safety I think has to be challenged and we need to encourage innovation uh, and progress within the whole organization as well. So that's not something to hide from really. And just on top of that, the responsibility, I think for this state of mind has to fall to leadership who have to overcome this themselves, yeah? Oh, and watch out. So there are some resistors who can sabotage your whole journey. So mm -hmm. we do need to root them out and deal with them as soon as we can. We cannot, we cannot simply have these people uh, blocking progress, really. Sure. Now, they may not always be as obvious as this pretty lady on the screen, but <laughs> we've got to identify those where they are. So there are various degrees of obstruction people can put in our way, but um, the ones who are going to sabotage our process, they definitely have to be uh, addressed as quickly as possible. So moving on, um, the next point that came up as an anchor was instances where there's plenty of rhetoric but no commitment by the leadership. Alan? Yeah, this is an interesting one. Um, depending on where you sit and your viewpoint in any particular company, um, you can look at particular leaders, managers, whoever they are, and think, well, they're doing a lot of talking here, but nothing's really happening. Mm. Um, and so, Again, we've got to remember that when we're dealing with um, putting the DevOps message out there, that you need to educate all the people in the uh, involved in, in this sort of environment, in this sort of movement. And this includes the leadership. This includes your managers, and CIOs, and CEOs, all the way up to the top. Mm. Uh, I've, I've talked to people that, again, I had, I had chats at uh, ZTech about this, and I had comments saying, we, we're talking to people, we're talking to people, yeah. but they don't seem to be listening. Don't give up on that. Yeah. I think sometimes it may be because think about what you're trying to talk to them about. Um, are, are, you, are you reading the right uh, research? Are you talking to them in the right way mm -hmm. into something that they're going to be interested in? Yeah. If you talk about deep technology and you're talking to a CIO, they want to talk about the benefits of it. I think that's a Not mistake. Not deep technology. It's a mistake we all make sometimes. It is, yes. Yeah, I've techniques. made it myself many times. Yeah. And you've got to think that they're in the power of position. Mm -hmm. And they're, they're going to be good listeners because that's where they are generally. You know, yeah, they're, they're good managers, good CIOs, good good analysts. What they're good at in many, in many respects is listening mm -hmm. and understanding things. So you've got to make them listen. But you've got to be able to couch your arguments in a way that spikes their interest so yeah. in a way internally we've got to be a salesperson within our own company yes sell the ideas 
Yes, I mean you can you can blame the people in charge as much as you like, but it, that's not going to solve anything. Yeah. So don't be afraid to get out there and teach the people above you what you're trying to do. Mm. Get to them all the time, and you don't want to be a pain at it, but don't just give up because they don't they say no the first time. So again, that's part of the culture change, isn't it? Really? Exactly. Yeah. Good. Okay. So the, one of the things that we obviously, certainly being working at Compure, one of the things that people talk to us a lot about is the lack of automation. Mm -hmm. uh, and they want to be able to automate their processes and reduce the amount of manual input going on. Yeah. So what do you think about that one? Well, from my point of view, this is an obvious and significant limitation if you're looking to kind of progress uh, into the future as well. The good news is that there are some easy solutions out there for automating. But what I suggest is don't go into it blindly, really. I think before you do that, what I really suggest is analyzing your current processes. And there are many mechanisms for doing that, really. So how does your work flow from ideation all the way through to delivery? OK. Now, I think this works best when you can bring in someone from the outside. So someone who's not been um, brainwashed in a nicer sense um, into believing that the current process is the only and smartest way of doing things. Yeah. Yeah. So I think from this, we'll identify that your constraints. So what is actually causing the friction and slowing us down in our delivery cycle? Uh, we typically then prioritize these um, findings, but that's not all. At the same time, why not think about what are the improvements we can make at the same time? OK? Yeah. So um, there's a couple of examples I'd like to share with you today. So the first one really. Um, is in our in the way we work currently we often have um, methods manual methods that we work with um, for example doing our code and data analysis so often i've seen people sitting down trying to read program lines of code thousands of lines yeah. of code or working with very outdated documentation what if you could automatically visualize how your code relates to each specific business function as carried out by the application. Wouldn't that be amazing? Yeah. Yeah. And I can imagine, you know, people spending hours and days doing analysis, which they could probably do in minutes, yeah. really. So that's one example of automation. Another one is uh, unit testing. We all do testing of our applications. But typically, some of the issues we face are things like, I haven't got the right test data available to me, or I'm working on a module that's impacted by somebody else working on a different module that's called by my program. So there's lots of manual interaction between different people working on the team. What if you could capture that unit test scenario? And not only that, what if we could also capture the data and any responses from any of the sub-programs being accessed by our application? OK? Yeah. Now, I think that would certainly speed up test cycles without worrying about creating or um, resetting test data or stepping on other people's toes even, whilst they're modifying the other sub-programs as well. So these are a couple of examples. And also, as you mature then into building kind of more automated pipelines, what we'll see is that we can do now in seconds or minutes what would otherwise have taken hours or days for us to be doing as well. So it's so essential for us to build that blueprint for automation. Yeah. Now, remember, we can't automate everything at once. So don't be in a rush. Take your time, yeah. but also seek advice from outside as well. People who've been through it before, even within your own organization, Absolutely. learn lessons and, and share the learnings from yourselves as well. Yeah, you don't want to go through this big bang because yeah. it never works. You try and boil the ocean and all you do is fail. Exactly, exactly. So I think that's a, that's a great point highlighted in terms of an anchor point, which I think most organizations have. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think so. Okay, so another anchor we identified really was constraints within tools. <laughs> yes. Go on, Alan. What did, what did you find? Oh, out? this. Well, this is a simple one. Um, call out the constraints. Uh, what is the input of the constraints? What are the benefits if you can overcome them? What are the constraints? Hmm. Well, uh, certainly things like uh, common ones like on the mainframe. Oh. Uh, how do we deal with working with the green screen, especially when you're bringing in people like millennials? Yeah. Um, so, you know, they want to be able to do the development, but do it in a modern, uh, mo with a modern UI, with modern uh, mm -hmm. point and click type technologies rather than uh, mm -hmm. something which, 
you have to remember all the command lines and stuff. Um, if you can, if you can overcome these types of constraints, then you're going to be be able to utilize more within more resources within the company. Share your thoughts with the tool vendors. The company where we're always asking for feedback, uh, either on the help desk or at lunch or the chat or, or wherever. We cannot make improvements unless we know what needs to be improved. Now, mm, true. we can't satisfy every requirement immediately, um, but we're always willing to listen and to be creative and uh, to find a solution uh, so that what you can do is is the best possible way of doing it. But I'd also add in there, we can't come up with solutions to everything. Yeah. No. So I, I would encourage uh, people to be creative in their own right as well. Find Absolutely. a way around that. Whether if it's not in the product, find a way around. But Don't wait is, for two years. This is the thing about DevOps, though. It's 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 all about utilizing what's out there. Yeah. You know, uh, uh, almost, almost a vendor agnostic in some respects. Very true. Yeah. Uh, we've taken the same type of approach in what we do. You don't want to let the tools become anchors simply because your organization has had them for many years. Yeah. You don't want to keep sticking with the same thing to do the same thing because yeah. you think it's the same thing and it isn't. I've seen that so many times. So you 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 may have tools that administrators who have had them for years. You may have inbuilt technologies that people are really fond of because they built them and it's their baby. Yeah. Uh, you you don't want to uh, you don't want to use a hammer and chisel to get these things out. You've got to have proper reasons for replacing them. Mm. But at the same time, keep it in mind that with a, a, a truly agile approach, it's not just agile in terms of doing agile with your code. It's becoming agile with the technologies that you're using to be agile, to actually follow the DevOps approach. It's all agile. You've got to, the technologies themselves have to be agile in the way you plug them together and use them. Mm -hmm. Call these out, challenge the naysayers, and, and, and make a case to overcome what they're saying is, oh, we don't need this, or this works. I mean, this is a common one. Well, it already works, but as I said before, it does this and succeeds, but does it do it at the speed you require? Mm -hmm. It's not just it works, but does it work properly? in the context of what you're trying to achieve. Mm -hmm. I've got an example of an SCM administrator who, who argued on ISBW, which is CompuWare's uh, SCM solution for supporting agile development, wasn't suitable to replace their incumbent solution. They were, they were if you like, hard boiled into this particular uh, way of doing things. Mm -hmm. When I asked him when, he, when we last saw ISPW in action, well, he said, never, I mean, never. Uh, seriously, these people, you've got to be able to challenge what they're actually, what their arguments are. Don't be afraid to go in there and say, yes, it works, but is it right for us? Mm, that's a good point, actually. That's a good point. So I want to share with you, uh, a, a, if you like, a visual, a, a vision that we have in CompuWare uh, about what makes a proper DevOps tool chain the value of an effective tool chain. Many of you will recognize the names and icons on this picture. Confluence, Jira, Sonocube, Jenkins, Excel Release. They're all proven and best of breed solutions. And the chances are your open systems, your distributed guys, are already using these to do agile and DevOps type approaches and they've been doing it for years. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, they're working in separate silos, but you have the opportunity to maintain and benefit from these people's experience. Don't stick with the siloed approach. Our, our partner ecosystem has been growing for, for, for some time so that our customers can truly leverage existing investments and existing technologies for better return on investment. That's a, I think that's a good point. A lot of the, the organizations I go into they already have many of these already been mm, used they do. by the open systems team. Yeah. Yeah? But they have no idea that these things exist. Or if they do, yeah. they don't know what they're being used for. Utilize these people's experience. We mentioned earlier mm -hmm. that we, you know, people come in from outside to take charge of DevOps projects. And some of the best people we've seen yeah. have been DevOps experts from the distributed space. Yeah. 
They may not be mainframe experts, but they understand DevOps. They can articulate it. And that's what you need to be able to articulate that and then utilize what is needed to understand what is needed to get this DevOps tool chain working. Yeah, good point, good point. All right. So, obviously, we can talk more about that. And if you're interested in it, please get in touch and we can do a deeper dive in that. But we've had additional points as well, just like in Act One about what driving people. We had a lot more points in terms of what was slowing people down. Um, so I'd like to pick up one point here. The age of mainframe staff. Mm -hmm. This is one we almost, almost came out with the top point. Yeah. It's, in fact, it's, this, is this a blocker? Well, it could be quite the opposite. We have seasoned mainframers highlighting that millennials are struggling to become productive, work, productive workers with ISPF, the green screen interface. Yeah. Now, that is, as I said, that is where a modern interface has to be applied, a modern UI, things like Eclipse and so. Yeah. We, now, we were fortunate to have at our Dev, DevOps event earlier this year a, a very smart, forward-looking uh, millennial who gave a presentation about how he has met the change and the challenge of working on mainframes because he knew nothing about mainframes that before he got the project. That was a good presentation, actually. Uh, and in fact, we have, we've got a recording of this remarkable man's presentation. And Kim, can you uh, take a note to, to include a link to Dom's recording in our email to our audience? Yeah. Uh, and, and I promise, guys, you will find this really interesting. Um, so I would recommend take a look at that link. Lovely. So now we're into the, what are the solutions? What would it take to pull up those anchors that have been fallen out or thrown out the back of the, 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 the boat mm. and slowing it down? So let's take a look at each of those in turn and see what we come up with. So first one, you need the mindset to accept the minimal viable product and to be able to iteratively develop, uh, deliver these products mm -hmm. in an agile way. That's all. What do you think? Yeah. So firstly, I think it's just worth um, explaining MVP, minimum viable product. So this is all about really delivering something of value to our business. It may not be the complete package that they've requested from us in the first place. But it's it's a it's a minimal a smaller version of that product, which gives them value and it's usable. Yeah. Yeah. So what I'm not saying here is go out and buy yourself a burger. <laughs> okay. I could do. Do we want? I know. We've we've accepted the fact that the only way to deliver it to our business was to undertake really large projects. Yeah. Now these could have lasted anywhere from six months to several years even. Mm. And I think we've all mm. been through that really. Um. Now some of these you may have experienced or heard about the massive catastrophic failures that have occurred where budgets were overrun, uh, resource changes impacted, and the delivery dates, of course, weren't met either as well. So, so all of these things um, failed miserably as well. Now, this is where these MVPs, minimum, minimum viable products, come in, really. They allow us to deliver to the business in smaller chunks, yeah. okay? Um, this also gives the business, as well as giving the business the value sooner, it does give them the opportunity as well to pivot. Um, now, what this means is really give them the ability to apply changes to the original requirements based upon what they were trying to do for their customers or in reacting to their competitive requirements as well. Yeah. Because obviously, as we go forward, uh, requirements may change over time. Now, I've seen um, real examples where there's been massive cost efficiencies, um, risks have been mitigated and value greatly increased to the business as well. So these are all key factors in, in terms of helping to pull up the, the anchors that we face as well. Now, perhaps what I would suggest really is to start with a pilot and take it from there. Okay. Now, the mindset change here is that just because we've never done it like this before doesn't mean we shouldn't do it like this in the future. And it's, it is possible, even with people when they look at the mainframe and they talk about these huge monolithic programs, mm -hmm. they say, how can we possibly split that down? Yeah. It is possible, even without refactoring capabilities. Yeah. It can be done. We did it ourselves at CompuWare. Yeah. Don't be afraid that just because you've got monolithic code, you've got 
MVP. You can. Great, great. Okay, so moving on to the next point in terms of what would it take to pull up the anchor? Uh, I think this is quite a big one actually, knowledge of what is possible. Yeah, I think we touched on this earlier. I mean, yeah. it, there is absolutely nothing wrong with look at other organizations and see how they're adapting and evolving their processes to get this done. Yeah. There's no better way of, of, to learn uh, from those who are already doing it right now. There's a lot of people out there, there's lots of blogs out there that you can get a lot of useful information out of. As I said to before, talk to the people in your own companies, the distributed people who are already doing it. Mm. Virtual all vendors are now promoting Agile and DevOps. Yeah, we see and, it all the time. Yeah. yeah, and go and see how they're putting it into practice, how they are putting it into practice. Because if, they're, if they really want to talk the talk and walk the walk, then they should be doing it themselves. Mm. So take a look at how this is being done within their own environments. Even better, ask them to engage you with their customer references. Mm. You know, and the, the references are out there. The people are already doing this. We're dealing with them themselves. You know, they're doing it themselves. They're talking to people like us. It is being done. So this Alan, proves the vendor credentials as far, yeah. as far as what you're dealing with. But it also gives you the ability to make your own mm. decisions and get your own DevOps yeah. things running. I just wanted to add in there as well. So a lot of the SIs I work with, yeah. the likes of uh, Wipro, TCS, they're doing a great job in helping organizations oh, yeah. transform. Yeah, They have their own best practices, their own uh, center of excellences. Yeah, so we're would, dealing with it to, to set those up. Definitely. So I would say call on those guys. They've been through it before. Yep. And they know what pitfalls to avoid as well. Yep. So call them in as and when needed as well. So yeah, good point. So continuing on, we've got um, another anchor pull, if you like, um, mm. and that is you need to uh, develop a joined up way of thinking about integrating tooling and integrating processes. Mm. So what do you think about that? One? So I was looking at this one and um, it, it, this really is where our dev and ops come together in a real practical uh -huh. sense, really. Yeah. And you know, if you ask yourself, how often do our dev and ops guys come together to really collaborate? Yeah. And in many organizations, it's very rarely. Yeah. Yeah. And so do they really appreciate the challenges that each of, each of them are facing? Um, and this is where, again, I would recommend typically that we pull together these cross-functional teams that we want to work with. So they, they prove their value here. So we need to um, really build these teams to make sure we can actually bring together people like the developers, um, testers, DBAs, kick systems programmers, for example, perhaps batch automation specialists. And the more they come together, the, the better the depth of collaboration they're going to build as well. Hmm. So there'll be mutual understanding and mutual respect for each other as well. And I think with this as well, the other thing that you've got to remember is hmm. not only is you talking to the technical people, but you've got to talk to the users. Yes. You've got to talk to the people who understand what you're trying to achieve in terms of the Apple applications. Take a look at the competitors. Mm -hmm. What are they trying to achieve? Yeah. Yeah. And, and get that information nailed down. Yeah. That's a good point, yeah. actually. But I think one way to facilitate this collaboration is to ensure that, um, for example, whatever tools they're uh, using are common uh, and or integrated in some way. So they have a common platform to work with. Mm -hmm. And, and I think moving forward, as these relationships form, they really are going to oil the wheels of innovation. And we talked about velocity earlier. We're going to be increasing the velocity as well, as well as targeting efficiencies and quality as well. So this really is a vital part of growing a culture of teamwork, commitment, and accountability, because everybody knows where they stand, really. Yeah. Now, we know this culture can't be forced. It has to be natural. So this is one way of doing it. So again, a key part of making sure we can pull up the anchor by bringing these teams together yeah. and collaborating really. So the next point we had was about having a visionary on the shop floor itself, not the leadership, but the shop floor itself. Alan. And that's taking it, that's if you like, taking our earlier arguments and turning them on their head in terms of who we're talking about. I mean, mm. it's really, again, we're getting to that collaboration here across the whole flow, across every level. Yeah. Now, you need to have clear, we've talked about having clear visions and directions from the top, but we need visionaries on the, where the, the hard work, if you like, is, mm. is happening. 
uh, and to take those passionate explorers that, that, who wanted to develop new ways of working, that, like like the the the, the uh, developer that we were talking about earlier, we dealt with, who who grasped the, the, the art of doing agile on mainframe and took it hmm. far further than we we ever expected him to. Yeah, this is where innovation thrives. You can identify these people easily because they're not afraid to challenge existing protocols or challenge themselves mm. in terms of what they know and to make efforts to actually bring new capabilities to themselves and to the team mm. you've got to encourage that behavior it, it's this is this management 101 mm. um, let them let them give them the head let them flourish and let them enjoy themselves this behavior will, will it'll be like the gas pedal in your devops car in, in your DevOps ship, it will accelerate it no end beyond your wildest dreams. Have exciting times and let them enjoy themselves. Exciting times, truly. Yeah, I totally agree with you. I like that um, term you use, passionate explorers. Yeah. Yeah. We need to enable these passionate explorers to get out there and thrive. So, a very good point, actually. Clear vision. This is something that, again, came through as. as something that needs to be articulated or the need for articulation the mindset of the leadership can dictate how far you can go they have to be able to direct support and above all fund the transformation now you can help you guys out there you, you can the the, the the leadership aren't something that you start you can't talk to you can they're not gods they're not gods they don't they they too need to adopt their thinking and to have a proper articulated justification for the journey ahead. It's mm. their job to challenge new ideas and kick the tires for from whatever is put in front of them. Yeah, agreed. They need the education, and generally they're aware of it. Sometimes they're not, mm -hmm. but question them. Question what they're trying to do. Do it in a way that couches it so they can learn and then take that forward and have their own ideas. Uh, I believe conferences such as DevOps, the DevOps Enterprise Summit, which is coming up soon, mm -hmm. are a must-see event for these sorts of people as well as yourselves. They can rub shoulders with their peers who are on the same journey and exchange ideas. Get them to realize that th these events are not a jolly. You can really get clear, hard benefits from these types of events. Mm -hmm. Yeah, And come back with something that you can actually physically use as a starting point again we created this work uh this paper the uh 10 steps to true agility mainframe agility which enables people to sort of articulate what they need to do we we can we will make sure that we provide a, a download link for this by the way guys so you can download the, the article and read it and distribute it get it out there to your people Get it out there to your management. Make sure that they're aware of it. It, it will make a difference, I promise you. Now, if we continue on from there, okay. uh, we had again, we've had lots of other additional points which we could talk about. Um, what would it take to pull up the anchor? Uh, we've seen, uh, well, I'll discuss one of these very quickly as we, we're getting quite close on time. On the right-hand column, sitting to the bottom, We've got publicity. Now we must appreciate that a culture change is taking place here. Mm -hmm. This is to be supported with an open and honest communications across the teams, as we've said before. We have seen great cultural shifts where organizations are starting to share their information, both internally and externally. They're not afraid of getting that information out there. Their successes and the lessons that they've learned it's helping to build the communities and break down these silos. Someone just last week said to us that I do not want to publish, uh, publish, pub, yeah. publicize. Thank you, publicize, <laughs> because somebody may poach my staff or they may criticize what I'm doing. Well, it's a fair point, but you must also ask yourself are you providing enough reason for your staff to stay? Are you providing enough reasons for your management to accept? what you're doing as being kosher so true yeah yeah are they going to give you the funding if they don't know what you've already achieved it's it's a misplaced anxiety that people have got to 
get over. Get that information out there. Stand up and present yourselves as experts, as heroes, because you are. So, I think that as we've seen, as we've discussed over the last 15 minutes, there are many ways to, to understand the perception of DevOps in the mainframe community. There's definitely a positive perception of DevOps, generally. But there's also apprehension due to the lack of familiarity with language and concepts, especially on the mainframe. And that is something we've got to overcome. So we have to understand this is going to take a, a little bit of time <coughs> to really work its way into the mainframe community. It's really something that we need to uh, make sure there's research done under and make sure there is a lot more awareness out there of how we can achieve that. Um, the second point here is that um, to gauge where people were in the DevOps adoption, that was one of our objectives at the beginning. Um, what, what we did find was that there were very few people who seemed to be comfortable with their company's adoption of DevOps. So although there are pockets of adoption, um, I think the mainframe team seem to be lagging behind slightly. Let's move on to the next point here. So to identify the key enablers and blockers to DevOps adoption. So again, a key objective of ours in this exercise. And we seem to find here that leadership drive and lack of knowledge about the art of the possible. Um, really they seem to be the two biggest blockers to DevOps currently. So that there seems to be a need for more CIO type education awareness and buy-in into transformations such as this, because they are very large. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I think that you need to be able to identify the key enablers and the key blockers as well to the DevOps adoption. Okay. So we need to, you know, take a look at, well, what sort of questions that we've got, you know, what sort of things that we've got to, to, to look at. That's a good point. Okay, so I think at this point, um, we're going to hand over back to Kim. Kim, have we had any um, questions come through on the chat at all? Uh, thanks, Atul. Uh, yes, we did actually. Uh, but let me first remind everyone attending that you can still submit some questions through the Q&A widget. Okay. Um, the first question that I would like to ask to you, uh, Atul. Um, uh, Atul, you talked about bringing cross-functional teams like developers, DBAs, Kix programmers, test analysts, etc., together. Could you please elaborate from real client experience how it is being done and what were the initial challenges faced? Uh, the asker says that he heard a lot about Lloyd's Bank transformation. Uh, could you please share any interesting stories supporting your point? Yeah, yeah, that's that's a good point actually. So, so these cross-functional teams, um, they're not the natural way we've worked with previously on the mainframe. There's typically been silos, even in departments. So development teams, QA teams, um, test teams, and production support teams. And typically what seems to happen is we simply throw the code over the fence or over the wall yeah. to the team next door. Say, right, this is now your responsibility. You take it on. And then that team would sometimes throw it back to us to say, listen, it's not of the quality we expected. Please rework it. So what this reduces is that friction of not allowing our applications to flow forward through the whole life cycle. The beauty of these cross-functional teams is that we do have a, a development development uh, arm. We have the testers, the QA people, DBAs, all of those as part of the same team. So as they collaborate, they first of all understand and respect each other's roles. And secondly, quality is built in right from the beginning of the project inception. It's not thought about towards the end as we're approaching development, uh, sorry, production deployment. So bringing these teams together, it's it's not doesn't feel natural initially, but as it's as you start working together, um, it's not very very um, long before people gel really well and start collaborating in a in a really natural fashion. So it's something I would say work on that. Start off with a pilot if you haven't done this before, 
but it really does um, bring all the benefits that you'd expect in terms of a team that's bringing together all the right skills to deliver what the, the business requires. And I think it overcomes the, well, it's not my problem issue. Yeah, yeah. Very true. Because, you know, if you've got somebody with very, very tightly defined boundaries in terms of what they deal with, they will not deal with anything else. Mm. If you have a team that has these cross-functional capabilities, they will talk, you will have scrums where you all discuss what's going on. And if something's wrong, you get the opportunity to bring that up and make it visible to the team at the earliest possible opportunity. Mm. So you left shift the issues. Very true. So I, th I think it really instills accountability and loyalty within the team as well. Yeah. So, so it's a very important part of transformation. That's a good question. Thank you for that. Yeah. Any Kim? Okay, um, another question. Uh, teaching all dogs new tricks is the biggest challenge we face. What are your thoughts on addressing that? Teaching all dogs new tricks. So <laughs> they, they sometimes say that all, all dogs can be trained, yeah? But it, it's really up to you how much time and effort you think you'd expend on that exercise as well. Um, I think what is definite is that the older the dogs, the more time it takes to deprogram them from how they do things currently to a, a new way of doing this as well. So um, what, one of the favorite techniques I've come across in the past is to make sure that we give them the responsibility, the people maybe who are saying they can't change. So as an example, so we had one um, SME looking after SCM, a source code management tool. And um, he was starting to dig his heels in, saying that their specific SCM was an immovable anchor. They, they couldn't move away from it at all. It is just too rooted in their site, really. And he said there's, there's high cost, there's high risk, uh, major effort to change. So these are all barriers to, to any kind of a change taking place as well. So what was done was uh, this individual was engaged to lead the actual SCM transformation. So he knew all the pitfalls. Now, he was the perfect person to do this because he knew how the current system worked. So over time, he took ownership and worked with our transformation team overall for about a period of about eight months or so. So he is now the new tech lead for ISPW at this site. So I think that was an awesome turnaround we saw. So that's just one example of how we can take uh, what we term in a nice way an old dog and teach them a new trick to move forward and support our business. In the, in the world which requires it forward. Yeah, and I think the other thing we've seen is where people um, try and use, for example, the new millennials, these new people who are up ta yeah. taking up the new technologies, mm -hmm. have been placed side by side with these old dogs. And in the nicest old, sense. In, in the nicest sense. sense <laughs> okay. In the nicest sense. But um, what you what, what you will see there is that, uh, and we've literally seen this happen. Yeah. Where they'll 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 be working away and on similar projects. And the, the, the old guy is sitting there on his green screen, tapping away, getting using all his Rex execs and his utilities and everything else. And he's a happy bunny. And then you've got the, uh, the new guy working with the new technologies, with the new methodologies, and comes to the end of the day, and the old dog is quite happy with his work. He's finished his program, and he's going, yes, I did my work. He looks over to the guy on his right. Yeah. This guy's got through what was today's work and tomorrow's work, and he's working on Wednesday's work. Yeah. And the, the guy saying, how on earth did you do that? We are working on the same type of stuff. Well, I did it this way. Because the new guys are always willing, generally, to mm. help. They're, they're not there to, to protect mm. uh, their old way of doing things. They're there, generally, to promote what they're doing because they enjoy it like that. And we've what you're seen saying, this physically to do. What you're saying is teach by example. Teach by example, but teach it in such a way as – it's not something where we're trying to replace you, the old dog, with new stuff. What we're trying to do is to let you do what you did before, but to do that and other things without having to work too hard. Yeah. We, we, had, uh, we were talking to a, a, a client recently, and they were saying, we've done 150 builds. Mm -hmm. We're really good, but it killed them to do it. That's true. Yes. Listen, we have to make it clear. For the last five minutes, we've been talking about old dogs. 
No offense to anybody out there. No, okay? no, no. All, right. <laughs> All that, we're quite happy with our four, four legged friends. Exactly. But the point is, you don't want to kill your old dogs, your old guys, <laughs> trying to get them to get this stuff out there. Okay. There are ways of doing it which is going to make them survive until they can do their retirement. Okay, swiftly moving on. Kim, swiftly back to you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I realize we are at the top of the hour, but I'm thinking maybe we can add one more question. Sure. So uh, to go where people were and their adoption of DevOps is a very fair point. Uh, somebody comments, would you like to suggest how it has been done with any of your clients? Uh, can you repeat that one more time? So how... Um, uh, to go where people were in their adoption of DevOps. So how has that been um, been done? At, at, uh, Ooh, that's that's what I'd like. How long is a piece of string? The there are people who have a, in, on the mainframe, and we're going to talk about the mainframe platform here. Mm -hmm. There are people who are well along in the adoption of the DevOps stuff, and we're using them as as test cases in a lot in a lot of situations, whereby they're coming back to us to give them their experiences about how they've done things and done things really well. There are people who are talking about DevOps and have, frankly, not a lot of clue about where they are or even what they want to achieve. They've taken in these DevOps terminologies, but they really don't understand it. And that's where they need to talk to people like us or talk to their people who have already done it maybe elsewhere in the system. But there is no real clear... Uh, <laughs> yardstick about what is success and what is not in DevOps. Everybody has to do it in their own way. Um, just because one company does it way X mm -hmm. does not necessarily mean that's going to be the way that you want to do it for your setup. Uh, it, it, it depends on what are the bits and pieces you've already got in place. Um, what particular things are you trying to speed up with the DevOps capability? Mm -hmm. What are you trying to achieve? Is it quality? Is it efficiency? Is so it Alan, performance? So Alan, it's fair to say that there is a certain sense of nervousness out there. Oh, yeah. These transformations are quite big leaps of faith sometimes. Mm. So um, the, the key thing really is that the, the people who are successful, or the organizations that are successful, are, are very open to putting up their hands and saying, look, we need some help in this area. Yep. Uh, in many instances, they, they don't currently know what success looks like. So uh, we've been able to help or work with some of these organizations yeah. to help them define that and then help define uh, a value stream for them and identify where the constraints are and move them forward. So there is expert help from third party specialists um, who can help them with the exercises. And obviously where we come in is to help them devise their tool chain based upon the outcome of their value stream yeah. mapping exercise as well. Yeah. So many organizations are way ahead. Others are starting the journey just now. Um, but suffice to say, there is a big buy-in from the, uh, yeah. the marketplace that this is the way to go. But in terms of the work, in my experience, 70% of the work has got nothing to do with tooling. It's got to, it's, it's to do with understanding what you are doing, understanding the concepts, getting the mindset set up, getting everybody to buy into the process, mm -hmm. getting the team set up, all that has to be done first. Mm -hmm. Then you can start talking about the technologies and the sort of things that we deal with mm -hmm. to help accelerate that, get you on the right platforms to get the right results. Mm -hmm. But you've got to get over that mindset. And we can help you with that as well because we've been there, we've done that. Uh, and don't be afraid to, to ask questions because we're quite happy to talk to anybody about any of this stuff. So there's plenty of follow-up we can do anyway. Absolutely. Yeah, good point. Kim, back to you. All right, thank you very much, uh, Alan and Atul. And uh, thanks to everyone attending today's webcast. Uh, for those questions we were unable to get to today, uh, we will make sure to follow up uh, after the webinar. Uh, please make sure to complete our survey before you exit uh, the webinar. Uh, and in the next week, you will receive the recording of this webinar along with the links to the white papers mentioned and the video. Um, of course, we encourage you to read them. And in the meantime, if you have any questions, don't hesitate to reach out to us. So this concludes today's presentation. Have a great day, everyone.